The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver it. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large it took three days to be all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast. When God saw what they had done and how they put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry the destruction. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he prayed to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. The Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry about this? Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged for a and sent its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, and as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head and he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he explained. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came away and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Uh, before I start, I want to acknowledge that some of the thoughts I'm going to share this morning come from a uh, nine minute video on Jonah produced by the Bible Project. I'll put the video up on it, our YouTube channel later or you can find it by googling the Bible Project Jonah. It's a fun video, brilliant and it's worth nine minutes of your time. I guess we all know that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish and lived in its belly for three days before the fish vomited him out onto a beach. That's the bit of the Jonah story that makes for a good Sunday school lesson, but it isn't really relevant to the actual message of the book of Jonah. It's actually an aside. The fish gets just three verses in the whole book. The story is actually more about a hammock than a fish, at least a lazy, sleepy, rebellious prophet who liked his comfort more than he values God's compassion for others. Now, whether you think this story is fact or fiction, Jonah was a real person. He was a prophet who lived during the reign of King Jeroboam II, one of the worst kings Israel ever had. 
we read in 2 Kings chapter 14 that this Jeroboam did evil in God's sight. And Jonah comes to this king and declares that God's favor is with him and that the king would win a battle to restore Israel's northern border. But Jonah had a contemporary, another prophet, a bold and courageous prophet called Amos, who then came to the king and reversed Jonah's prophecy, saying that God's favor was not with the king at all. Rather, God's justice was against the king and he would lose the territory because he was so evil. Jonah wasn't exactly a false prophet because his prophecy did come true, uh, for a while at least. Jonah just wanted an easy life. He didn't want to upset the king and he was prepared to use his relationship with God and his calling from God for his own comfort. So we come to the story in the book named the book named after this rebellious prophet. It's a story full of comedy and satire, wit and wisdom. And Jonah is the ideal protagonist. He's a lazy man, a miserable man, an angry man. He's not a nice man. And the word of the Lord comes to him, get up and go. Get up, get off that hammock and go. Have you noticed how many times Joseph is, uh, Jonah is lazing about in this story? God says to him twice, get up. And on the boat in the storm, he's asleep. And the final chapter seems to be all about his comfort, lying in his hammock under the shelter of the plant, waiting for judgment to come on his enemies. We probably all know the story. God tells Jonah to get up and go to Nineveh and pronounce judgment on it. Now, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, the mighty empire of the day, the fiercest and bloodiest nation that had ever existed up to that point in history. Israel's bitterest enemy. And going into that city, standing up in the marketplace as a Jew and pronouncing judgment, was a certain death sentence. And you know the Assyrians' favorite method of execution of their enemies? They skin them alive. Jonah runs in the opposite direction as far as he can towards Tarshish, which is probably modern day Sardinia in the Western Mediterranean. God sends a storm. Jonah says, it's my fault. The sailors toss him overboard and he gets swallowed by a big fish, who three days later vomits him out on a beach on some Mediterranean shore. Jonah cleans himself up, tries to get rid of that smell, and that would have taken some time. He hooks up his hammock again between a couple of palm trees, lies down, and enjoys his surprise holiday. But the word of the Lord comes a second time. Aren't you glad the word of the Lord comes to you and me more than once? Get up and go to Nineveh and deliver that message, God says. God is the God of the second chance and the third and the fourth and the umpteenth chance. chance. And I just feel that there's some people listening to this who need to hear that. God will not give up on you. This time Jonah obeys. He arrives in Nineveh, spends three days taking in the sights, plucks up the courage and rattles off just five words. That's his message. Well, it's five words in Hebrew. In English, it's 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. And I bet he thought in 40 minutes I'll be dead. But look what happened. The whole city repented from the king to the cows. Yes, even the cows. We missed that bit off the reading out. You would think Jonah would be pleased, wouldn't you? Nineveh has repented. That would look good on this CV. But these people were his sworn enemies and he didn't like it. In fact, the reason he ran away in the first place was not actually because he feared the Assyrians or that he was scared to die. 
No, it was because he didn't want to give the Assyrians any chance to repent because they were his enemies. They were horrible. And because they were his enemies, of course, they were God's enemies. They didn't deserve to come under the umbrella of God's mercy and his compassion. They were the other. Never mind, he thought, in 40 days' time, God will destroy them. That's what he said he would do. But God said, no, I won't. They repented. So Jonah goes off in a strop. He gets very angry. He reverts the type and he gets his hammock out again. He's lying in the desert just outside the city, hoping and praying that God will relent and will destroy the city after all. In fact, he says not for the first time, God, I'd rather be dead than alive if you don't destroy the city. And then we have this strange section about the plant and the worm. God provides a plant to give shade and comfort for Jonah, which he fleetingly gets to enjoy just for one day. And then the worm comes and eats the plant and Jonah wakes up the next morning and he's got no protection from the sun and he gets angry again. It's better to die than live here, he groans. What's going on? In chapter four, three times God challenges Jonah about his anger. First, he says, is it right for you to be angry that I relented and I'm showing compassion to your enemies? And Jonah just stonewalls God. He doesn't answer. So God then does his thing with the plant and the worm. And after more strop, God asks Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant dying? And Jonah basically says, yes, it is. You see, he's more concerned about his own comfort than he is about the people God has sent him to minister to. And here's the main thing. He's more interested in God calling down the fire on his enemies than he, than he is with his enemies experiencing God's mercy and compassion. And actually, that's the final question God asked, asked Jonah. Are you really more concerned about a plant that gives you shade than the 120,000 people and their cows living in spiritual darkness? And with that question hanging in the air, the book ends. We don't know Jonah's response because, and, and this is the nub, the book isn't really about Jonah. It's about you and it's about me. You see, the story holds up a mirror to us. The story isn't about Jonah and a big fish. It's about how you and I respond to the compassion and mercy of God towards all people. Even our deepest enemies, even those who hurt us the most. How do you answer that question? What's more important to us? Our comfort, whatever that means for us, our, our bank balance, our home, our work, our leisure, our summer holiday, maybe the things that are being turned upside down in these days of COVID, or God's compassion for those we, who we see as maybe not worthy of his grace, our enemies, the other, those who are different to us, who we don't understand, or maybe those who have hurt us in the past or even the present, the child who bullied us at school, the husband who walked out on us, the father who turned his back on us, the child who threw everything back in our face, the boss who mistreated us, the neighbour who turns the street against us. Do you forgive them enough to want God's mercy to penetrate their heart? Do you want God's compassion to reach out to the other through you? That's the message of Jonah. Jonah's five word message in Hebrew ends with the Hebrew word hapak, H-A-P-A-K. It's translated destroyed in the NLT. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. But in the NIV, it's more correctly translated overturned. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overturned. Hapak has two meanings in Hebrew. For example, it's used in the story of the destruction of Sodom. Sodom was hapak, 
It was destroyed, it was overturned. But it's also used more positively. For example, in Psalm 30 and verse 11, you have packed my mourning into dancing. You have turned over my mourning into dancing. Do you see the satire here? What Jonah intended for destruction, God meant for transformation, for turning over. And that, of course, brings us to Jesus. Because Jesus was continually deconstructing the idea of who the bad guys were. Those who his disciples thought would get God's judgment because they weren't like them. Other races, Romans, Phoenicians, Samaritans, Greeks, or lepers, prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners. But Jesus said, love your enemies. And of course, we were all enemies of God. And that's the point of the cross. At the cross, we are all made equal and we become God's friends, even though we consider, even those we consider our worst sinners, the worst sinners. And we all, and we are all turned over or overturned, but we are not destroyed. Our mourning is turned over to dancing. And the message of Jonah is this. Do we want to remain in our state of comfort, living a life of privilege and ease because we are God's chosen people and we are in, we are okay? Or do we want to part, be part of a movement, a kingdom movement that declares the mercy and compassion of God, ultimately demonstrated at the cross? Do we want to demonstrate that to all people, even those who have hurt us? even those who are different to us. So that, let's look in the mirror and let's ask ourselves, what is God asking of us today? Amen.